and in the 2021-22, a more perfect union colloquium, dangerous ideas, misinformation, and stereotypes in history. The FBI's annual hate crime statistics act report reveals that 2019 was the deadliest year on record with 51 hate crime murders, a 113% increase over the previous record of 24 set in 2018. The FBI reported in September of 2020 that the number of hate crimes is at its highest point in a decade. We have seen a 14% rise in anti-Semitic hate crimes and a 9% rise in anti-Latino hate crimes in the last year alone. As we try to understand these numbers, we must acknowledge that hate originates in many different places. One possible orig origin is stereotypes and misinformation. We are exposed to them every day. We learn them from our peers, from our families, and even from popular culture. Stereotypes are pervasive and powerful because they shape our world and how we view it. They can also determine how we act towards others. In this presentation, learn from historical events how seemingly harmless stereotypes can lead to prejudice, discrimination, and things even dark darker, such as lynching and genocide. Participate in a discussion about stereotypes with us today and how we can learn from the past to create a more tolerant tomorrow. Our presenters this morning are professors Ron Weisberger and Robin Worthington. Ron Weisberger is director of the Hol Bristol Holocaust and Genocide Center and adjunct professor of history. He earned his bachelor's at Glassboro State College, now Rowan University, and earned his master's in history at Kent State University. He earned his PhD at UMass Amherst. He has been at Bristol for 40 years. His areas of special interest are 20th century American history and the Holocaust. Robin Worthington is Associate Professor of History at Bristol Community College and a proud Bristol graduate. She earned her bachelor's from Wesley College and her master's in history from the University of Connecticut. Her areas of special interest are Native American history, American women's history, and the history of race and gender. She has been teaching at Bristol for 10 years. I am thrilled to be able to introdu introduce these amazing colleagues. Please join me in welcoming Ron and Robin. Well, thank you, Emily, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, so Ron and I thought that to start our presentation today, we might say a few words about misinformation and disinformation. So when we think about misinformation and disinformation, we think of it as something kind of new, right? It's in the news today, people are talking about it. But in fact, misinformation and disinformation are old. Uh, there's many instances throughout history. For example, I'm sure most of you have seen this engraving by Paul Revere, with its angry, vengeful British soldiers in their red coats shooting down unarmed colonists dead in the streets of Boston. But what you may not know is that the bloody massacre perpetrated on King Street is a masterful work of misinformation. We know this because we have Revere's original sketch of the scene that very night, of, of the event that very night and it looks nothing like this. But it did work to convince many Americans that the British were slaughtering colonists in the street. And this example from 1863, the miscegenation ball was part of a series of caricatures created by a pro-democratic, anti-Lincoln newspaper in New York City. It shows white Republicans also sometimes referred to as black Republicans, <coughs> dancing with black women and intermingling with black men. It played on the racial fears of voters in order to convince them not to vote for Lincoln in the election of 1864. These characters, caricatures and this pamphlet, the blending of the races or miscegenation were the invention of two correspondents from the newspaper. These two actually invented the word miscegenation, which means mixed race nation. They wrote the pamphlet pretending to be abolitionists, promoting intermarriage between blacks and whites, 
and sent it out to dozens of real anti-slavery folks, asking them to endorse it. They even sent one to Lincoln, asking for his endorsement. He didn't fall for it. We don't know how influential this disinformation campaign was, but while Lincoln overwhelmingly won the election, he lost New York City, bigly. So misinformation and disinformation is nothing new. Our topic today, stereotypes, are also a kind of misinformation. But we're going to start with a few definitions. Good morning. Uh, so what is a stereotype? It's an oversimplified generalization based on a characteristic, for example, race, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual orientation, age, positive, mostly negative. Um, and um, here's some examples. You know, far from being harmless, though, stereotypes are one of the most mo common manifestations of prejudice and one of the most persistent. Some of them are innocuous, like men are messy, but many of them, is, as we'll, you'll see, are very dangerous. Uh, now, just to distinguish, prejudice leads to discrimination. Prejudice is a belief, uh, thoughts, feelings, attitudes about a group, not based on experience or maybe based on some sort of misinterpretation, uh, but it's a prejudgment and, there, and it's preconceived um, and leads to discrimination, which is really the prejudicial treatment of different categories of people or things especially on, uh, on groups such as race, age, or, uh, or sex, as you'll see as we go through this. And here's a really great uh, uh, graphic from the Anti-Defamation League showing how stereotyping down here at the bottom under bias leads to individual acts of prejudice, on to discrimination, bias motivated violence and then eventually the ultimate crime against humanity genocide so now we'll share some examples of stereotypes with you and how these stereotypes really did lead to much more serious consequences Images of Native Americans have been used and are still being used by non-natives for many reasons. Beginning with the colonization of the Americas, images of Native American women in particular were used as allegorical representations of the American continent, the American colonies, and then the United States itself. This was a way that Europeans could tell new narratives about indigenous peoples that suited their colonialist gaze. The native woman was first depicted as an Indian queen in printed engravings, tapestries, and sculptures. She was often shown as an opulent, heavy-set woman, semi-nude, sitting or standing among the abundant natural resources of the Americas. And we can see here she is at the top right here, and at her feet are uh, fruits and uh, vegetables, plants. She has this little bird on her arm, which I believe is supposed to represent a parrot. <coughs> um, also notice these weapons, right? So weapons were, uh, implements of war were sometimes included in these images. And this reflected Europeans' reactions to the New World which they thought of as foreign and hostile, but also an environment that could be exploited. Eventually, the Indian princess replaced the queen as a symbol of the Americas. She was a younger, thinner representation of the American colonies as distinct from Great Britain. A feathered headdress and skirt became customary dress and her complexion became lighter. She most frequently appeared in images about British colonial relations, especially the American pursuit of liberty, such as this uh, 1774 pro-American print 
on the so-called intolerable acts. Here on the left, we have uh, the British ministers and Lord, Lord North, and they're proposing a trade monopoly. They're discussing a trade monopoly on the colonies. Okay. So here she is over here, the Indian princess, in her long dress with bow and arrow, and beside and beneath her are, are American colonists. And she is, she's exhorting them, aid me and prevent my being fettered. In this engraving, following the Continental Army's victory at Saratoga that brought the French into the war on the American side, America is represented by the Indian princess here. Here she is. Look how much lighter, look how lighter skin is here. And she's kneeling at the feet of Liberty. This is Liberty. And uh, at the top, I think you can probably might be able to see it. She has, you can't, but she has, uh, you'll have to take my word for it. She has a Liberty cap on the pole. You can't see it, good. She has a Liberty cap on the pole. That's a discussion for another day. Next to her is Benjamin Franklin, of all people. Here he is. Oh, of course, he's dressed in Roman costume, and he's being uh, protected by Minerva up here with her sword and shield. But there are other conflicting ideas of Native Americans. One is the stereotype of the Indian as a violent or barbarous savage. In most portraits of Native Americans, they are represented with a tomahawk or a scalping knife in hand, as if they possessed no other but a barbarous nature. And really, to be fair, Christian nations might always be represented with cannon and ball and swords and pistols, but that seldom happens. Euro-Americans are depicted as innocent victims of this savagery, especially from male Indian males. The best known, <clears throat> excuse me, the, this painting represents the best known case of scalping during the American Revolution. The woman's name is Jane McCrae, and uh, she was engaged to a loyalist lieutenant. Uh, in case you don't know, a loyalist is an American colonist who decided to support the British and not go to the Patriot side. They did not support uh, the War of Independence. In any case, uh, this woman is abduct abducted, scalped, and shot by Indians under the command of Br uh, British Lieutenant General John Burgoyne. Commanders of the Continental Army immediately realized that the incident could be used to generate greater su popular support and military recruits for their cause. Interestingly, throughout the war, both patriots and loyalists scalped as a way to terrorize their enemies while also claiming that when their enemy scalped, it proved that their cause embodied Indian savagery. Remarkably, the Indians as the savage is even mortalized in one of our founding documents. He, referring to King George III, has excited domestic insurrections among, amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages. During and especially after the Civil War, images of Indian savages persisted as non-natives moved west across the plains to claim lands in California and the Oregon Territory. Emigrants' guides, handy books of advice that were sold to travelers, frequently warned of savage Indian attacks, when in reality, tentative figures show that from 1820 to 1840, about 362 emigrants were killed by Indians, while 426 Indians were killed by emigrants more misinformation. During the Civil War, the U.S. government recruited additional cavalry to deal with Native groups in the ongoing Plains Wars. The more troops on the Plains, the more, the more dangers to Native peoples, those fighting and those who chose not to fight. For instance, in the fall of 1863, a group of about a thousand Cheyenne and Arapaho were returning from peace talks 
and they were given permission to camp along Sand Creek, Colorado, by the commander of the nearby Fort Lyon. Colonel Shiving Shivington, uh, a colonel in the Union Army and also a Protestant minister, and two cavalry units attacked despite the American flag raised by Chief Black Kettle, killing 150 to 200 men, women, and children. Perhaps most chilling is that the, de the, is that the dead bodies were badly mutilated. Violent savages can be treated, sav uh, violent savages can be treat treated violently. After the Civil War, the stereotype of the savage Indian com uh, continued in the very popular Wild West shows that traveled around the United States, but also throughout Europe. The Indian savage also commonly appeared in the popular dime novels of the late 19th centuries, century that solidified the myth of the West. And eventually, the Indian savage makes it into the Hollywood Western. In popular culture later, we'll see Native Americans as Tonto, the representative of the good, helpful Indian. But TV Westerns like Gunsmoke and Bonanza will continue to show Americans, bring Americans right into Americans' homes, this image of the savage. And this stereotype continues on today, and so does violence against Native Americans as revealed in this study by the US Department of Justice. The perception of Indians as violent has other consequences too, including hate crimes and high incarceration rates. So I want to move on to another pervasive uh, stereotype, which is uh, African Americans, who are an essential part of our population from before we were a country. And the stereotypes we're going to talk about started way before we, uh, the United States became a country, uh, because most African Americans were brought here as slaves, chattel slaves, really, uh, the, uh, property. and. Um, in order to justify slavery, which continued, of course, once the United States became a country, it was embodied in the Constitution, as you know, um, and, and continued it until after the Civil War, amazingly. So a good part of our country, we had um, a whole segment of our population as slaves. But in order to justify that, we had to create these stereotypes. So one of the most pervasive stereotypes was that of the, quote, Sambo, one who was uh, some sort of overgrown child, happy to serve the master, right, passive. Even though slaves worked from dawn to dusk at least six days a week, they were somehow characterized as being lazy and in need of directions from the master. So again, <clears throat> one of the stereotypes, you know, that they, also that they came from uh, Africa, where they were, again, savages. You know, that savage thing continues, as Robin was just talking about. Um, so that, that stereotype then gets set in. Uh, the stereotype was transmitted in all kinds of ways, for example, through songs, literature, pictures, etc. cetera. You, you would envision or see a grinning, wide-eyed, heavy-set man happy in what he's doing, eating watermelon, you know, uh, needing the direction, obviously, of white people. Uh, this became a character in the minstrel shows. And minstrel shows, by the way, were, you know, like TV or, you know, or movies today. That's what people went to see for entertainment. And here, white men would darken their face and dance to what was called Jim Crow. This term, Jim Crow, uh, became the title from uh, the form of segregation that was created in the South after the fall of Reconstruction. So as you know, slavery was abolished by the 13th Amendment, and the 14th and 15th Amendment, African Americans were given uh, supposedly equality, 
However, um, that wasn't the case with the fall of Reconstruction. We have the creation of um, segregation, or what some pe other people would call apartheid, where African Americans were separated and put in a subordinate position. And these stereotypes were working in order to perpetuate that. Um, at the same time, again, this is the way stereotypes work. You know, they're not logical. Um, we have African American men seen as savages. Where have we heard that before, right? Dangerous and brutal, and certainly a threat to white women. And this again is a theme. You know, the poor white women who are subjected to these attacks by these uh, savages, whether they be uh, um, you know, Native Americans or African Americans. Uh, but they, African American men, were seen as mentally inferior, physically and culturally behind white people, and even ape-like in appearance, as they were portrayed in the uh, mass media. Um, this led to, again, a horrific practice of lynching in the South, and even some other places, Indiana, for example, where literally thousands were murdered by hanging and often in public displays. These were not, you know, in the forest somewhere where no one was looking. They were, as you can see from some of these uh, articles, people knew what was coming. They came in a picnic atmosphere bringing their children while a, an African American would be tortured first and then murdered, hung. Uh, it's amazing. It's just amazing. Uh, why were they being treated this way? Yep, they were accused of raping or attempting to rape a white woman. Um, and by the way, there was never, even though there was some attempt to pass legislation to make li li lynching illegal, as you might imagine it would be, it was never passed. It could never get through the Congress. Um, something as obvious as that, uh, mainly because the Southern, particularly Southern legislators, senators and Housemen were too inconst, you know, in, in the, uh, they couldn't, they wouldn't let it through. You, you, um, you may have heard the term recently, filibuster. Well, that's, that's what happened. Uh, so this type of stereotype, for example, then was given actually scientific justification. Science is very important, but sometimes, you know, it, especially earlier, it went in a different direction. So we have something called the eugenics movement of the early 20th century, which posited that African Americans were inferior. You know, they had a whole hierarchy of uh, who was on top and who was on the bottom. Not surprisingly, white men are on top, right? Um, African American women also were seen as somehow different. As for example, they didn't really feel the same pain in childbirth as white women. And as I think many of you may know, they were experimented on, you know, uh, in uh, mostly always against their own will, and they were sterilized, sterilized. <laughs> uh, and also um, there's a, an example of where a woman, you know, where they used uh, in cancer research, used their genes without, of course, they, that knowing it. So this horrendous treatment of women as well as men continued. Um, looking at women too, there was also the contradictory stereotype of, of African-American women. As, as the men were somehow savages, the women were seen as mammy or Aunt Jemima uh, in, the pa in the pancake commercial. You can see these pictures here. You know, gets a little bit better, you know, but still there as a stereotype. Um, um, this mammy was asexual, heavy, just wanting to take care of white people and their children. That's, that's, that's what their lives were committed to, right? Um, and this view was seen, you know, in the most popular movies, probably the most popular movie in the 1930s was Gone with the Wind, where a character, a main character, is portrayed as a mammy supporting slaveholders and hating Yankees. That was it. Uh, and by the way, that was based on probably one of the most popular novels of, uh, of the time uh, by Margaret Mitchell, uh, Gone with the Wind. So both in terms of reading novels or seeing this movie, uh, this is the way African Americans were portrayed. And looking at movies in general, you know, as movies became more popular, uh, African Americans were portrayed in all, in all these negative ways. You would never see uh, an African American in the movies other than as a servant. 
you know, or as some sort of fool, like step and fetch it, some of you may have seen. Go, you know, watch old TVM movies and you see, <laughs> that's all you see, you know. Feasts don't fail me now, you know. Even Apple and Costello movies, whatever those old movies, African Americans are portrayed as servants or as fools. Uh, even um, as uh, dancing, uh, what's young little Shirley Temple? Shirley Temple, you know, with uh, Bill with Robinson, the, with you the know, butler. He was da dancing butler. away, you know, to, you know. Somehow Shirley Temple's a little smarter than Bill, you know, even though they're both good dancers. So anyway, I mean, this is not. Uh, this is pervasive. This is what people saw uh, whenever they went to the movies. And the movies, of course, as they are today, were very popular. Um, at the same time, these stereotypes were found in the radio. Here's an amazing one. of The most popular radio shows in the 1930s was Amos and Andy, supposedly about two black men. And yet they were portrayed by two white men. Uh, Charles, you can see them on the left, Charles Corral and uh, I forget the other guy's name and uh, Freeman Gottson and Charles Corral, there they are. Now, when it moved to television, and as you can see in the early days of television, of course, they had to use black actors. However, you know, they were portrayed in the same way, that is, they were um, as fools, you know, uh, always getting into trouble. And the women, like for example, the wife of uh, one of the characters, Kingfish, Sapphire, was seen as bossy, dominating, her husband not very bright. Uh, there was a lawyer named Calhoun always uh, getting thrown out of court because he was a, a fool. Uh, so um, that's what people saw. And um, again, with uh, as far as television goes, it wasn't until the, the late to 70s really that we see um, African Americans in a different way, right? So, you know, we, uh, with the Jeffersons, for example, or, you know, a number of other programs where at least we could see them as human beings and not as fools. Early television, as I said, Amos and Andy, you may, anybody knows the Jack Benny show, you had Rochester, you know, again, the servant. So anybody's view in, in popular culture would be seeing African Americans in, in these stereotypes. Um, <clears throat> Women, again, we talk about women as being mammy, but the contra <laughs> of course, contradiction is that we have mostly light-skinned women, and skin color, of course, is essential. African-American women, uh, these light-skinned African-Americans, they seduce men. They're hypersexual, they're sexual, they're dangerous. So, you know, you have a mammy, or you have on the other side, you have the, uh, the harlot or the whore, you know. But uh, anyway, that there's... Uh, there's where things were for a long, long time. And while these stereotypes have changed in recent years, uh, they still live on, really, sadly, looking at African-American men as dangerous. We saw what happened with recent police killings, um, George Floyd, et cetera. And then we have women portrayed, black women oftentimes portrayed as welfare queens, somehow living off hardworking white men or white people. Um, so these stereotypes, and again, African-American men seen as athletic and physical, not really academic, despite the fact that, uh, you know, we have great, <laughs> great academic Henry Louis Gates and uh, Cornell West, et cetera. But anyway, that, these are the stereotypes that are in the minds of so many people when it comes to African-Americans. Uh, these long-held beliefs are unconscious or subconscious, although sometimes they're right out there. And we'll talk about how we can deal with them. So anyway, that's African Americans. We now turn to yet another stereotype. So Chinese Americans uh, were one of the first Asian groups to migrate to the United States in great numbers. They came to the West Coast during the gold rush. Uh, they came to look for gold, of course, but when that didn't work out, I always want to say that didn't pan out, but that's a little bit too on the mark. <laughs> Um, uh, they also took jobs cooking and cleaning, uh, and then they worked for mining companies, often doing the most dangerous jobs, like setting the dynamite, uh, and also for railroad companies. Uh, because they were seen as a threat to white workers, racial stereotypes and prejudices, uh, uh, prejudice and discrimination uh, were created. Uh, notice here, again, the white woman as the victim in this in this cartoon here, or uh, notice too, uh, the angry Chinese face, 
uh, he has not only has a gun, a revolver, he has a, a, a knife and a torch. Gosh, only knows what he's going to do with that. Uh, and there he is astride uh, the white woman, uh, the yellow terror in all his glory. Some of the stereotypes included that uh, Chinese were sneaky or crafty, uh, that they were drug addicts. He's referring to like opium. Um, they were diseased. Uh, they preyed on white women, of course, and that they brought Chinese women into the country as prostitutes. Here is uh, the wasp, a 19th century, and yes, W-A-S-P, you're reading it correctly, a 19th century magazine from San Francisco showing Chinese workers taking jobs from white workers, but also laying blame at the feet of the white people that hire them. And here, amazingly, another issue of the wasp showing a Chinese man as some kind of demon. You can see here he has a forked tongue and he has all these arms that are reaching out to do all these different uh, nefarious things and the caption at the bottom, the Chinese, many-handed but soulless. Appeals to Congress by white Californias, uh, Californias at this time uh, elicited the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Uh, this was the first time the United States had prohibited uh, all immigration of a certain group of people, and this prohibited all immigration of Chinese laborers. Japanese began arriving on the west coast of the United States around the turn of the 20th century, and were quickly targeted for segregation in schools. They were also prohibited from owning land with the California Alien Land Law, uh, uh, land law. Uh, and later this um, law was expanded, prohibiting uh, Japanese from uh, even um, uh, leasing any land, so no, no property in their hands at, in in any way, shape, or form. And obviously, uh, Japanese were not welcome in, in many neighborhoods at the time. Of course, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, things ramped up into some Jap anti-Japanese hysteria. Japanese and Jap Japanese American became the targets of discrimination and prejudice and even violence. And this is uh, some graffiti on, on uh, someone's, looks like someone's garage. And this comes from Seattle, Washington. Again, the West Coast was really uh, the issue. And apparently, to help prevent, J <laughs> Emily. <laughs> <laughs> as a way to help prevent um, uh, Chinese and Chinese Americans from being targeted by uh, anti-Japanese sentiments. Uh, in December of 1941, Life magazine uh, included uh, a way for people to tell uh, Japanese from the Chinese. Uh, and these little, um, little characterizations on the side here are are, are kind of amusing, it, it may be more amusing if they weren't so sinister. So for example, uh, here's one here that, that claims that the Japanese never have rosy cheeks. But down here, the Chinese sometimes have rosy cheeks. So I guess the idea here is that rosy cheeks are preferred. Uh, the Japanese, of course, at this time had become the bad Asians and Chinese the good Asians. Uh, as um, uh, Chinese uh, people were encouraged to uh, participate in the war industries uh, um, programs. And then uh, in 1942, the Office of War Information began spreading propaganda about the Japanese, using racial stereotyping to promote fear, and of course, the most office often focusing on the, the danger of Japanese men to white women. And notice the uh, long 
claw-like fingernails and the angry, sary face and, uh, and the knife, right, with the knife being sort of the silent killer, right? So it's sort of the treacherous way to kill. Propaganda also came in different forms. Uh, take a look at this uh, magazine uh, from 1942 called The Jap Beast and His Plot to Rape the World, no doubt making a reference to the, to the rape of Nanking in China, um, but it also purports to contain uncensored photos. Well, heavens knows what those, heaven knows what those were. Um, also notice, though, that in the title, um, Japanese have gone from Japs to Jap as a way to singularize them and to make these characteristics um, of, uh, seem to ha uh, be a, for all people, all Japanese people, and not just some Japanese people. We also see this singularity in this very popular song from uh, 1942, We're Going to Have to Slap the Dirty Little Jap, which not only uses that singularity, but also um, subtly, or, or maybe not so subtly, encourages violence against Japanese Americans. And in February of 1942, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, quote, authorizing the evacuation of all persons deemed a threat to national security from the west coast to relocation centers further inland. Of course, this meant those of Japanese ancestry who were given roughly a week, one week, to close their businesses, sell their homes, and pack their clothes, linens, and pots and pans. They had to bring their own sheets, their own towels, and their own pots and pans with the United States government didn't have to support, didn't have to supply them. And then they reported to assembly centers and then on to what euphemistically was called relocation centers. More than 110,000 people were removed to internment camps. Two thirds of them were American citizens more than one half of them were children. These relocation centers were in remote areas. And usually in places with harsh weather conditions. Uh, Topaz was, as you can see, uh, located in a desert. And when Ron and I were looking at these slides, Ron's first reaction was, what, Ron? Auschwitz. It looks just looks like, like Auschwitz. Auschwitz. Yeah. Yeah. Manzanar, although with those beautiful mountains in the background, was also uh, in a desert. And the temperatures uh, soared during the day and, and plummeted at night. And the housing here, these, these barracks, were not, uh, they were very hastily built, and so not terribly either cool or warm. This is a good point uh, about the fact that um, about Germans and Italians. And Germans and Italians were in, were in internment camps in the United States. But the difference is in the numbers. Um, many, many more Japanese and Japanese Americans were interned. It was in it because it was very racialized. They looked like the enemy, um, which is, you know, gets a little muddy when we're talking about people of, of um, European descent, right? Um, so the last internment camps, uh, camp closed in March of 1946. Um, Japanese Americans, as you can see here, were not very welcomed back into the communities that they left. Um, families lost an estimated $1.3 billion in property, another $2.7 billion in income lost. In 1976, Gerald Ford officially repealed Executive Order 9066 in 1976. In 1988, Congress issued a formal apology and gave $20,000 to each um, 
uh, each to over 80,000 Japanese Americans as reparations for their treatment. But as I'm sure you know, the story doesn't end there. Since the COVID pandemic, Asian Americans report increasing violence directed at them again. And you can see here, eight in 10 Asian Americans say violence against them in the United States is increasing, according to this Pew Center report. So I think one of the things you can see is that these stereotypes are really pervasive. And um, even as times change, these things keep coming up. And um, the, the, th the uh, fourth stereotype that we're going to deal with is a good, a, another good example. This is uh, Jewish stereotypes. Uh, Jewish stereotypes go back to early Christian days when Jews were considered non-believers and responsible for killing Christ. So it's what we call sometimes anti-Judaism, as opposed to anti-Semitism, which is really anti-Jews as an ethnic group. Uh, sometimes they're connected, obviously. But uh, the anti-Jewish, uh, anti-Judaism stereotype was is found, sadly, in the Gospels. Jews were accused of, you know, killing Christ, and um, therefore they were um, the enemy. This was the construction, really, of the early on of the Jew as the enemy, sometimes associated with, with the devil. Uh, they were out to destroy Christians, right? Uh, they lived in a, you know, in a Christian society, but they were dangerous. Uh, one of the tropes even had Jews responsible for killing Christian children and using their blood for ritual purposes. This is called the blood libel. And there's actually a new book out on that subject. Um, and you can see some pictures here. This started in the 15th century, or 14th century, I think, in England, but it's, it's spread as, again, Jews using uh, Christian blood to, uh, of, the kid, of kids, kidnapping them, using their blood during the Passover uh, to make matzah, you know, unleavened bread. Um, and here's an example, even much later, in 1913, where a Russian Jew named Menachem Mendel Bellis was acute, falsely accused of ritually murdering a young boy in Kiev. And uh, intellectuals, so-called, testified against Bellis in court, saying, yes, it was a common practice of Jews using Christian uh, for their blood. So again, this kind of nonsense, though, becomes acceptable. Um, they, um, another, uh, and this is by the way, it was used, of course, by the Nazis. Here you can see in one of the most uh, onerous of, uh, of the Nazi um, newspapers, Der Sturmer, here they're playing on this idea of the Jews using Christian blood. Uh, another stereotype, though, so we have the Jew as uh, dangerous um, because they're anti Christian. But now we have, coming out of the Middle Ages, we have the Jew as stere uh, stereotyped as being financially corrupt and miserly. This, of course, came out of the medieval period where Christians were not allowed to lend money or charge interest. You called usury, right? Uh, Jews were. So, of course, a few Jews, most couldn't do that anyway, were able to do it. They were, you know, they lend money. But these stereotypes then, of course, work on generalizations. So now Jews were put, who were pushed into these financial arrangements um, were stereotyped. But then all Jews were seen then as being miserly and cheap, et cetera. And this, by the way, is reflected in some of our <clears throat> major literature. Um, the Merchant of Venice, where Sherlock, Sherlock, uh, Shylock is, uh, again, an example of that stereotype. Or in Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist, where Fagin is used again with this stereotype, uh, and also persecuting kids, you know, in Oliver Twist. So again, you know, this is in the 19th, well, Shakespeare in the uh, 16th century, and uh, Dickens in the 19th century. And of course, these books are still read now, right? Not that you know they may be great works of literature, but if these uh, these stereotypes are baked in, it only supports that. Um, so the fr and then there are phrases that are used. Um, I'm going to Jew you down. 
you know, it was, I don't know if that's as common now as it was, but it's out there still. And all Jews are greedy, right? All they want is money. Um, interesting, when the rise of capitalism occurred, especially in the 19, eight, late 18th, 19th century, Jews then became associated with this ruling class, uh, especially in banking, like the Rothschilds. Um, however, um, most capitalists were not Jews, but that's the stereotype that Jews are these capitalists, you know. And therefore, those who felt exploited could then turn on Jews, blame them, you know, for their misery. Uh, however, <laughs> you know, since these things are never uh, logical, at the same time, with the rise of opposition to capitalism in the socialist movement in the mid 19th century, there were Jews involved in these movements, Karl Marx, for example, important person. And thus, for we get the capitalist communist conspiracy, right? All right. Uh, you're either a capitalist or you're a communist, whatever. You know, it's illogical. The stereotypes are just that. They're not based on logic. But people believe them, right? Um, there's a, um, another stereotype which kind of comes out of that is the fact that Jews are all powerful, right? that they're out to control the world, even though Jews are less than 1% of the population of the whole world and of the United States. I've asked my classes sometimes, what percentage of the population are Jews? And you'll hear 20, 25, 30%. No, they're less than 1% of the population of the world, you know, maybe roughly 15 million at, at best out of a population of billions and billions, you know. But anyway, they're out to take over the world. Uh, there was a fake doctrine called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was written in the early 20th century by the secret police in Tsarist Russia. Same time we saw that thing about the guy being accused in 1913. And it purports to be about a secret cabal of Jews planning to take over the world, right? These less than 1%, they're going to take over the world. And as absurd as this is, it's still read and circulated throughout the world. You can buy this. You can buy this book, especially in the Middle East, but you can buy it elsewhere. I'm sure you can find it online. Uh, and sadly believed by, by enough people. Um, and you may recall that just two years ago, the march in Charlottesville, Virginia, you saw these guys marching through. The Jews will not replace us. Replace us for what? What? Yeah, but yeah, there it was. So, um, and there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, this is part of a lot of what's being, you know, we will see online, you know, you can, Facebook and other places. And um, it's, um, you know, again, it's an example of stereotypes and how dangerous it can be because it was utilized, of course, in the most extreme way uh, by the Nazis during World War II in which every Jew, whether you're a woman, man, child, had to be eliminated, right? They were dangerous and they had to be murdered in the most horrific and barbaric way. Six million of them, 1 million point five of them being children. So this is where things lead to, right? Um, one would hope that given that, that that kind of stereotype would die as well as other stereotypes, but it doesn't, sadly, it doesn't happen. Um, you know, we, these are four that we've used. Of course, we saw how women were being portrayed here, right? So sexism is, is pretty rampant for white women being subjected to these, uh, these devils. Um, have, you know, they, have no, uh, uh, they have no control over themselves. They have to be protected by white men, I guess. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in recent times we've had, we have stereotypes of Mexicans, you know, our former president talking about what they bring, right? Uh, disease, they rape, you know, again, same, same terms, same terms. So uh, people in Latin America portrayed. So these stereotypes are, are real. And the question is, what do we do? How do we deal with it? Um, one of the things I w one of the ways we deal with it was to confront them, to talk about them, right? And I, I want to say that what Robin and I just did in many states now, we we could be fined and arrested, we would lose our job because we're not allowed to teach this anymore. So-called critical race theory. Laws passed in Texas, I don't know, I think 10, 12 other states now. You're not allowed to raise these issues. 
And uh, the fact is that it's just the opposite. We need to talk about it and deal with it, right? There's always a measure of truth in any stereotype, you know? There are Jews who are wealthy. There are African Americans who are athletes. That's not the point, you know? <laughs> sure. Uh, but it's far, far from the whole story, you know, in terms of the whole group. And besides which, so what? You know, uh, all, every group in the United States that we've talked about and others have contributed to this country. They've made this country what it is. And the fact that we're not allowed to talk about the negatives uh, is really sad in 2021. Uh, because in fact, what we need to do in order to deal with stereotypes is we need to honestly talk about them, see where they come from, and realize that they are fallacious. Um, we need to see people as individuals, it's sort of ironic, because the uh, Americans like to see themselves as individualists, right? <laughs> and yet, you know, we're trafficking in these stereotypes of, of groups being this or, or that. We need to see that each person is their own pe person and they shouldn't be put in preconceived boxes. Um, so I think uh, we'd like to have a, hopefully a little discussion here uh, to hear from you. I think uh, Deborah's going to monitor the, the, uh, the chat. But I think, again, we want to say that the way to deal with stereotypes is to confront them directly, learn from them, and get rid of them. No questions? Yeah. OK. If you have some questions for Ron and I, please put them into the chat. And uh, we will uh, do our best to answer them for you. We have a big crowd. Any questions from the? Uh... Well, I hope you learned some things. And uh, I hope it was a, an, interesting, an interesting presentation. So, Emily has a question. Yeah, so thinking about discrimination towards native populations today, right? How, how are Native American stereotypes still, you know, in, in have the stereotypes changed towards Native Americans now to be more, less violent, but have different connotations? Um, I think. Well, it's, it's complicated, of course. Um, I think today Native Americans are that, that long-lasting sort of stereotype of violence, uh, of Native Americans being violent, um, does still, I think, resonate with, with Americans. Um, that stereotype, I, I would argue, has been replaced um, by um, stereotypes about alcoholism and drug abuse. Um, and uh, even that, of course, uh, does not tell the whole story. Um, Native Americans are, uh, you know, have huge historical trauma that they deal with and pass from one generation to the next. And so if we see, what's like Ram was saying, if we see them as one thing, as embodying one, you know, uh, you know alcoholics or drug addicts or, um, you know, the, part of the problem for Native Americans is they are, um, they're a small population when we can compare to other groups, but they also have, uh, have never had a, a great deal of power in society. Um, so when we think about, for example, the civil rights movement starting in the 50s and 1950s and 1960s, um, it wasn't even until the 1970s that Native Americans uh, had a really cohesive, what I would call a pan-Indian uh, civil rights movement. And even at that, uh, because their numbers are so small, it was not nearly as um, present in, in the minds of, of non-Native Americans. So, yeah. One, one of the, uh, you know, elections do make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our Secretary of Interior, for the first time, is a Native American. And that, that uh, department, that cabinet, is a very important uh, one, especially in relation to African Americans. So there's an example where maybe a little small modicum of power is given you know, because we chose <laughs> to, the right president, in my opinion.
There is one question um, from Mike Mark asking, doesn't federal law overrule state laws? I think you might have been referring to what you were talking about earlier on. So, uh, race theory. That's a very yeah. good question. Mm -hmm. Very good question. And it's being fought over <laughs> even as we speak because supposedly that's the case. You know, the Constitution overrides state law. But the way in which the Constitution is interpreted oftentimes uh, depends on the court. And we can see exactly the court ruling in favor, at least up till now, for example, of Texas, which passed a law overriding the, the, what the uh, Roe versus Wade, which is a constitutional question. We'll have to see you know, what happens. But up till now, it looks like this court may undermine uh, giving the states more power than the um, uh, than what sh should occur with the federal government in regard to the Constitution. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's up to the courts to, to determine that, and it depends on the Constitution of the courts. Uh, you know, we saw, you know, when I mentioned about lynching, right? One would think that uh, lynching would be illegal, and yet, the, well, the federal government never passed the law, but it's not clear whether, even if, the, if they did, whether it would be an over, you know, you know, whether the courts, how they would rule on that. You know, um, not to get into the wheat there, but in um, 1898, the court ruled in Plessy versus Ferguson that we could have separate but equal, which set, which really established segregation for the country. And that went again, you would think that would go against the 14th Amendment, which said that African Americans were legal. But the courts ruled in Plessy versus Ferguson that no, it's all right the states could have segregation as long as it was, quote, equal, which it never was. And uh, it took until 1954 with Brown versus the board to overrule that. So it's a very good question, but I don't think it's, it's settled by any means. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think, too, the, the, um, the issue is that um, generally school systems and schools and what's taught in schools is, is conventionally been seen as, as state and local, right. under state and local yeah. control. Um, the, the, um, when we see things like, like the Brown case, I mean, that addressed discrimination. So that was, that, you know, it was a constitutional question. Um, what's taught in schools, I think, is, is largely considered to be state and, and local. Um, even, even what's in textbooks, um, I know we're doing a lot of Texas bashing today, but um, history textbooks, for example, uh, a lot of what is in history textbooks has to do with Texas. That sounds really weird, but Texas um, ish orders all of the, their, they have a, an over overarching school board that orders textbooks for the entire state. Now, you know, Texas is a very populous state. So textbook makers, publishers, very much want to please Texas, and uh, so they pay attention when Texas says, we don't want this, we do want that in our textbooks. And then those textbooks go out across the entire country. Yeah, you know, for something I didn't bring up, I mean, it's all part of our history, but there's something called the lost cause. There, there was, even though the South lost the Civil War, um, the, the way in which it was interpreted, especially beginning in the late 19th and early 20th century, was that it was the war between the states. It wasn't about slavery. It was states a war rights. between the states. And that was involved, and, in the, and the Reconstruction was a disaster, you know, even though some really great things happened during that period. And that occurred, that continued for a long time in the textbooks. That's what people read. There's a very good, uh, a very good program on MSNBC called this, uh, the Civil War that's going on now. I would recommend it to anybody. You can go see it because it really shows how this played out for a long time. Uh, the idea that, again, these stereotypes were perpetuated in the schools through the textbooks, as, as Robin said. Get them while they're young. Get them while they're young. There's a, a, a comment here um, from Carlos Almeida. I have a question slash problem with the term white nationalist. I would characterize them as white supremacists. The term white nationalist keeps, perpetual, uh, keeps perpetrating that this country is a white nation. Yeah. That's, that's a very good point. Very Carlos. good point, Carlos. So I have a question. What would you recommend? What tactics should we use as educators to help people understand the 
this information we're, we're seeing, you know, kind of today. And I use this in terms of the, the, the rewriting of history as to something like what happened on January 6th. We know, we all saw what happened, and yet people are trying to recharacterize it, misinform people about what that actually was. How, how do we have conversations when these things are happening in real time? You know, and we're, we're watching them happen. You know, is there any advice on how we might approach these kinds of things when it, it just seems like people are denying the evidence in front of their faces? You know, it, it, like what strategies do you recommend? Bless you. Um, I, I I can tell you what I do in my classroom. So, um, uh, if if a student brings up something in a discussion that I suspect is misinformation or disinformation, my first question to them is why do you think that that's true? And I ask, and then, you know, whatever they tell me, then we go from there. But it opens up a conversation about evidence and support and perhaps even more important, um, where, what your sources are, what sources are you using for your news and information. Um, sometimes I'll ask them to, you know, they'll ask a question that, you know, some obscure question that of course I don't know because they think I know everything, but I don't. Um, and uh, so we do a Google exercise. Okay, let's Google and, you know, let's, let's you, know, w you know, give me some different sources. You know, tell me what you're reading in different sources. Um, and, uh, and I think that helps students to, um, think about uh, their so not only their sources of information, but how knowledge is created, right? That we have these ways in academia of creating knowledge, and it comes from, again, from evidence ex and examples. And when I have them write, um, they have to use support for their writing. They can't just write an opinion piece. Uh, they have to give me examples. They have to cite their examples um, as a way to and, and hopefully that helps them to understand um, how, you know, how to how how to how to be good consumers of information, right? To look at things with a critical eye. Yeah, no, it's important. You know, that's why you know education needs to emphasize what we call critical thinking in the sense that that Robin was talking about. The courses like history that we teach, uh, literature, whatever, the humanities are important you know, because it helps students if we do it the right way, and it's not always easy, uh, it helps students become more reflective and, and to realize, again, how is knowledge constructed? I think that's the most important thing. Uh, a lot of these stereotypes are baked in, and they're not easily, you know, dislodged. But I think if we have the forum, I don't think we can attack the people who say it, but we have to engage them in a way that we can see exactly what what is the truth. And you may not even get everybody, but I think hopefully with our students, we can help them to become more critical thinkers and reflective. That's our job, you know. And the fact that, as I said earlier, that in many states you're not allowed to teach this is really dangerous, very dangerous. Um, and who would have thought this would be the case in 2021? But I think we as educators have to fight against that as best we can. Thank you for inviting us. Oh, I'm glad to have you. Here I've got one.